before we start, I would just like to send my solidarity to Apsana Bagan, the MP for Poplar and Limehouse. Um, Apsana, you are an inspiration to our movement and I'm wishing you all the very best in your recovery sister, solidarity. So evening, um, I'm Nadia Jama, one of the Labour NEC CLP reps, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to this important Labour Assembly Against Austerity event tonight as part of Arise 2022, an online festival of Labour's left ideas. Here in Britain, we need to both build resistance to the Tories and continue to gain support for socialist solutions to the crises we face. The discussion we are having tonight is an essential one as part of that, looking with our excellent panel at our public ownership, stopping the privatisation scandal and public control are essential to tackling the crises facing Britain, from addressing the cost of living crisis to the emergency, climate emergency and the urgent need for more resources for public services like health and education. Extending public ownership across the economy is key. Today, the French government announced they have fully nationalised EDF. That comes after they forced shareholders to keep prices down this spring. This is what we need, energy, rail and mail back in public ownership. And we'll talk more about that tonight. We need to link up with all those fighting this ruling class offensive and for progressive alternatives, making links between all those key struggles and our values of unity. Hope and solidarity are more important than ever, and that's what Arise Festival is all about. Please donate if you can and buy a ticket for the whole of the festival. Due to an amazing level of interest, as well as this Zoom webinar, we are streaming live direct from Arise YouTube page and over a dozen Facebook pages. As the event goes on, please post questions in the Q&A section on Zoom and we'll put some of those to our panel. Our panellists will each speak for eight minutes tonight and hopefully by the end of our event, Boris Johnson will be gone and we'll announce it if it happens. So for our first speaker, I'd like to introduce Ian Lavery, MP for Wandsbeck. Ian, the floor is yours. Nadia, thank you very much. And, and, and can I, I, I echo your sentiments with regard to Absalona Began. She's been a fantastic member of parliament. She's very poorly. Um, she's been under uh, horrendous abuse and uh, she's facing the potential, uh, potentially, deselection. In a solidarity to uh, Apsana and anybody else who might find themselves in the same position. We're with you. We'll not let you down. We'll never forget you. And uh, as I say, solidarity to everyone out there. A massive shout out, Nadia, to um, the uh, everyone in the trade union movement, every worker that's in dispute with. The, uh, the bosses, for whatever reason it might be. Uh, because, you know, we live, we live in strange times. We're living in times where the, the people who are making in excess of £500,000 uh, a year are telling people who are on less than £20,000 a year that they should tighten their belts and they should not be asking for a peer rise. What a load of tosh. That's why we need to have a look at what's happening at this moment in time. I think... I think, listen, I've got, as a, as a member of Paul, I've just got to mention what's happening in the Commons as we speak. Myself and my good, group, good, great friend, Kate Osborne, Member of Parliament for Jarrah, is on the panel as well. We're still sitting in different rooms in the Commons. Lots of things are happening. Let's hope, Nadia, that the pre prediction you made, by the end of the night, we've got rid of Boris Johnson. Let's hope that it's the... the, the uh, the government fall as a result. Let's have a general election and get rid of these two rags because we live in truly extraordinary times. The country's on its knees, but Johnson and his cronies seem to think otherwise. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Working people are claiming benefits and using food banks. But everything's fine according to the Tories. Let's just say, you know, Today, 
There's been 38 resignations in this horrible place. 38 resignations. And Boris Johnson is claiming that he'll stay on regardless of what happens. You know what Boris Johnson is actually saying? He said that regardless of a vote of no confidence, if, if there is a vote of no confidence, he'll ignore it because he's not at the behest of the Tory party, he's at the behest of 14 million people who voted for him to get the job done and carry out the people's priorities. That's what Boris Johnson is saying. He's threatening MPs who vote against them that they'll be deselected and he'll call a general election. The man's off his trolley. He really is. And, you know, to be honest, when you sit in, like the PMQs today, you sit and you look at these people uh, and the way in which they treat Boris Johnson, no wonder this country is actually on his knees. And I'll just say one more thing before I move on to public ownership. I'm sure everybody on this call will remember the time when everybody was saying about uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Anybody put Jeremy in would be 20 points clear in the pools. We're not anywhere near 20 points clear in the pools. And, uh, you know, the, the reality is with the worst government and the worst prime minister and living memory, and living memory, how on earth are we not 20, 25, even 30 points clear in the pools? But listen, with regard to public ownership, I've got the, the luxury, as it were, if that's the right word, of working both in the, the nationalised coal industry and then I was in the privatised coal industry when the industry was privatised in mid, the mid-90s. And it's, it's absolutely amazing how people really kind of get to grips with what nationalisation means from somebody who's worked in the, the in industry. I work for the National Coal Board. I mean, public ownership, nationalisation, there's different forms of it. The, the nationalised coal industry was a tremendous success in 1947, right up to the mid-90s. It really was. And it makes a big difference because it doesn't put profit, sorry, it doesn't put profit before people. It, it means that you can control what you own because that's the, that's the slogan which people should remember. You cannot control what you do and own. So public ownership is extremely important. Under uh, public ownership, nationalisation with uh, the, the, the National Coal Board, we had a closed shop. You had to be a member of the union or you wouldn't be employed. When you went in uh, for your first ever job, when you went in to sign your contract of employment, you signed a contract of employment and you signed your union forms at the same time. You know what? I crave for them times to come back because every single worker in this country should be in a trade union. You look at what benefits there were um, under nationalisation. You had proper trade union recognition. And in, in terms of trade union recognition, you had collective bargaining. You had the check-off facility. You had trade union facility time. You had everything that an employer should give to a recognised trade union. When I say recognised trade union, I'll just say to a trade union. We had fantastic opportunities for consultation on a day-by-day basis. The trade union, the workers' reps with the management. Safety and health, so, so important, particularly in, in the more dangerous of industries, but very, very important right across every single uh, workplace is the need to be able to kiss your wife or your partner when you leave work, leave for work in the morning, and return to see them uh, safe and well at the night time. And it's really concerning that uh, safety and health regulations, the EHSA, for example, these type of organisations are losing whatever credibility and, and whatever uh, powers he actually had. Safety and health in the coal mining industry was so important. And when the industry was nationalised in '47 then things change dramatically. We even have, in, under law, uh, miners, uh, union inspectors who can inspect any part of the pit anytime they wanted 
under regulations. Wouldn't that be a fantastic thing under uh, in, in different workplaces? That's what public ownership, that's what nationalisation can actually bring. Negotiating wages, terms and conditions so everyone gets the correct wages, everyone gets the correct, the correct terms and conditions. People are trapped as a collective and negotiations on behalf of the, 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 the workforce. Again, extremely important. Collective bargaining, sectoral collective bargaining. This was absolutely the top of the agenda under public ownership under nationalisation. We had the fantastic trades. We had proper apprenticeships, by the way. Apprentices who actually get taken on and are in the, the uh, workplace, at the college, workplace, college. So they eventually have the qualifications that you can use right across the world, anywhere, the best qualifications. And we had we had mining qualifications, mechanical, we had electri electrical, we had um, surveying, we had plumbing, we had bricklaying, uh, anything you care to imagine. We had fantastic educational programs under a nationalised industry banner. Really important again in the apprentices, uh, as I say, weren't there and being exploited. They were there to be trained. And many of them had a, a job from beginning their, their apprenticeship in the, uh, the late teens uh, right up to uh, the age of 65 and beyond. But we didn't put uh, the, 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 the profits before people. And I think Nadia mentioned energy. Let me just mention energy and me summon up. You know, if we owned the energy companies, not put the cap on here or a cap on there, if we owned as a nation the energy companies, you wouldn't see the 50,000 elderly people die every single year because they can't kind of put the heating on. We would make sure that they had the correct amount of heating and light what they need to live their lives. We could give them it free, and we would give them it free. We can control what we own. We wouldn't see the, uh, the, the negative impact on people up and down the country in terms of hikes in energy prices because the money would be invested and the money, instead of being given a dividend or less, the money would be there to ensure that prices uh, reflect the true price and the, the true cost of living and indeed what people could absolutely bloody well afford. Energy would be the top of my agenda with regards to nationalisation. You know, I was really proud uh, to be part of the uh, the, the Corbyn team uh, during the on the run up to well from 2015 to 2020. I was absolutely delighted with the manifesto we had. We said we'd renationalise real meal and water. I would have gone a lot farther than that, by the way. I would, I would look at the financial institutions and much more just to make it fair for ordinary people. And I think uh, Nadia mentioned before, you know, about the, about the, the idea of this, co this, this conference and these rallies over the next month or so, left ideas, socialist solutions. You know, when you look at them, they're not really lefty ideas anymore. They're not. But, you know, they're not real. They're not Leninist, Trotskyist, revolutionary ideas. It's common practice in most countries, what we're demanding. Common practice is basic human rights, and we deserve that. We shouldn't have to go on strike for a decent pay rise when inflation is between 9 and 12%. And we've got the, the you know, we've got everyone now, and I'm delighted, it's great to see Kevin on the call, and I think that the, the teachers deserve everything they can possibly squeeze out of the government and, and hopefully the, the teachers will be on the, the ballot box very soon with regards to uh, what the government is uh, looking to afford them and other people in the uh, public sector. I've been run on for ages, Nadia. I was just going to need you to... Oh, this weekend. <laughs> it's the epitome of what we stand for, what we've treasured all our lives. I hope to see you all there. I must dash, but listen, solidarity and nationalisation forever. Brilliant as ever.
absolutely wonderful to hear from you and I'll definitely see you in Durham. Okay, um, I'm just going to bring in Sam Browse now, who's one of the Arise volunteers, um, just to give us all a message. Over to you, Sam. Hello comrades, how are you all doing? Um, welcome to the Arise Festival. Uh, it's been cracking one so far and I hope uh, you get involved with the rest of the festival too. To do that, uh, you can check out our sort of ambitious, it is very ambitious, it's massively ambitious, I'll come back, back to that in a minute, our ambitious programme of events um, on our Eventbrite page and I'm sure that will be posted in the chat as I'm speaking. Uh, you can see one of the next kind of, the, the, the kind of, uh, evening, next evening sessions we have um, as part of that is an event called Real Change in Ireland, uh, Lessons for Left, that's next Wednesday at 7 o'clock and John McDonnell will be speaking on that along with um, uh, Emma Sharon from Sinn Féin and Jeff Bell who's the author of The Twilight of Unionism and um, also an exec member of Labour for Irish Unity. So it'd be fantastic if you come along to that and check out all our other events too. We've got um, lunchtime events, we've got evening events on a Sunday as well. Um, that, that you can get involved in. So, so please do get involved. Um, and to come back to the idea that this is an ambitious programme, because it is, we're, we've got over 30 events for the whole thing. This doesn't happen on its own. Um, it costs money. And uh, we need money to keep going. And it's donations from people like you on this call uh, that, that make all this possible. And actually, if at, if at least 20 people uh, donate a tenner on each call, that's, that, that's, that covers the cost of the festival. That's how much money we're talking. So again, it'd be fantastic if you can dig deep, uh, hit that donate link, uh, go through to the, the PayPal and, um, and, yeah, and help, us, help us to run events like this and keep events like this going um, so, so that we can discuss these fantastic ideas and these socialist solutions to the crisis. Um, so thanks very much for tuning in today. Um, check out the rest of the festival programme and dig deep and donate. Thanks very much, comrades. Thank you, Sam. And please do look in the links for, um, look in the chat for the links to be able to donate. It's really wonderful to get together and talk about the things that um, remind us why we're doing what we're doing in the labour movement. Um, so I'm going to move on to our next speaker now. Um, with great pleasure to introduce Kevin Courtney, the General Secretary of the NEU. So the floor is yours, Kevin. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Nadia. It's a great pleasure to be here. You'll know probably that my union isn't affiliated to Labour, but I'm really pleased to have the invitation to be with you tonight discussing these important ideas. I, I do need to reflect a bit on today. There's all this big news, but for teachers, support staff in schools, one of the bits of big news is the change of Secretary of State for Education. Nadim Zahawi gone, Michelle Donnellan in. But what I reflect on is that's seven secretaries of state in the last eight years. None of them a teacher, none of them engaging with teachers in the ideas that we need in our schools, all of them seeming to see it as just a stepping stone in their career, not a, not a degree of commitment to, uh, to education. And on the theme of the meeting tonight, one of the things that's united all of them is seeking more and more to move towards marketization and privatization of different bits of our education system. And I just wanted to run through a, few, a couple of those different ways that privatization is happening. I'm starting with a personal reflection. My mother was a school cleaner and a dinner lady. Uh, and she was one of the first privatized before this government by a previous Tory government, she was privatized. And at that moment, I came to understand what privatization, what the efficiency of privatization is. They say private business knows how to do these things better than public services. And my mother's experience was being asked to clean more classrooms for less money. And I think at that moment, we, we knew that, I mean, that was essentially what privatization was then, working class women, working longer for less. It's not efficient, it's not big and clever. They haven't got some marvelous scheme why they're more efficient than the public sector. It's just bullying, it's driving down wages. And you know, the cost of living crisis now is a wages crisis now. And a big proportion of this is due to that outsourcing. It's due to that privatization of women like my mother and it's still happening now. And I'm really pleased to see cleaners fighting back in many uh, hospitals and others aided by unions. 
That's one bit of privatization of our education system. At that time, we might have thought it was about, you know, classic working class women, but we've let it get hold and we haven't fought back successfully enough in many ways. And it's extended to lots of other groups of workers. So professional teachers in supply teachers, they've been massively privatized. The same thing happening to them. Uh, bosses whose only function is to answer, is they employ someone to answer a phone from a school and then they phone a teacher. They do nothing, but they take a huge proportion of what that supply teacher earns and they pay far less than the rate. And that's a big reason why there aren't enough supply teachers now. It's also a very big reason why Nadim Zahawi is completely wrong. And Michelle Donnellan would be completely wrong if she thought that, that, that she could do this that, to get supply teachers to scab on teacher disputes. Supply teachers are the very worst treated teachers by this government, and they want to be treated better. They're not going to collaborate with the government in running us down. I, I, I think it's important to say that in Wales, the Wales Labour government, in an agreement with Plaid Cymru, have recently decided that they are investigating steps of removing privatization from supply teachers. And we really want to support them in that. If we can take one group of workers out of privatization, that would be a good step. So good on Labour in Wales. A, sec a third group of privatization. You may have heard recently that the Abu Dhabi Sovereign Wealth Fund is buying up a chain of private special schools in our country. These are privately owned, entirely publicly funded. These are special schools where children with special needs, the, the, school, the school will charge the local authority 50,000 pounds to send a child to one of these schools. And uh, when local authorities run them, the average charge is about 30,000. When they're in this privatized grid, it's 50,000. Now, we, were recent, we recently had a strike at uh, one of these schools in Hackney, Leeways. Diane Abbott, the local MP, was very important at helping us on the picket line there. And we won the dispute in terms of the conditions of our members working at the school. But what we haven't won is that that school is back in the public sector, not charging as much, not taking all the profits out. And that school, in uh, uh, the, the schools like that school often don't have playgrounds for the, for the children with special needs. In some examples, we hear of schools that don't put the heating on in the winter because, well, you know, you put the heating on, it costs money. You keep the heating off, there's more profit. So privatization matters there as well. But the biggest bit of privatization and it's not classic, but it's moving in the wrong direction and moving faster and faster is academization. And, uh, and academization, I want you to understand, is, dr is driving people further and further from the public sector, further and further towards the private sector. I'm not suggesting that they're gonna start charging for, pri for private education, but they've got rid of local councillors, they get rid of parent governors, they get rid of staff governors, and they replace them by decision making by an Academy Trust chief executive, usually with a hand appointed board, the Academy Trust board. And that has really bad consequences. There are two ways of improving a school from inside the school. There's loads that could be done from outside. Sure start. Uh, getting rid of unemployment, looking after people, that can improve, uh, improve schools from the outside. That you're giving the school more money, that can improve education. But within, there's two ways. There's patient and you're trying to improve teaching and learning. And there's this easy way. Change the kids in the school. Get rid of children who aren't going to do well in exams and replace them with children who are going to do well in exams. And research we're doing points to academy schools, sometimes other schools as well in the, in the accountability mechanisms that we've got, re removing children, sometimes by exclusion, sometimes by having a parental contract that a parent won't sign up to, sometimes by a sneaky little conversation where somebody says to the parent, this school's really, it's a bit of an academic school, it's not really the right school for your child, you should take them away from this school. And we know that happens in all too many cases. And I tell you, we now understand there is a motive. If you're the Academy Trust Chief Executive, and if you want to justify paying yourself half a million pounds a year, 
then get your school's results up. Then you can say, look, the school's results have improved. Now I deserve this money. And there's, a, there's that sneaky way of getting your school's results up. And of course, it hasn't got results up at all because the kids who weren't going to do well are in other schools nearby. And unless they, you know, it hasn't improved education. It's just moved children around. We have to fight against this proposal for academization. Nikki Morgan in 2016 told us that she was going to academize all schools by 2022. We defeated her bill in, in 2016. Lots of Labour councillors, I will say, we've got some Tory councillors saying the right thing on it at that moment, but lots of Labour councillors, really important, and we defeated their bill at that time. There is a schools bill going through now. I, I think that Labour councils can play a really big role in resisting the, 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 the rush towards academization that might come through that bill. This is a bill to defeat. It's a bill to make sure that uh, the academization doesn't go all the way, that an incoming, a change of administration can put these things right. Privatization is dam and marketization is damaging education as well as damaging the, the terms and conditions of the people who work in education. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you so much for that, Kevin. Really calling out the con that we're seeing um, being ramped up under the Tory government in our education system. So thank you for your comments. Um, we've got people with us today from Belfast, Bristol, Lisbon, Nottingham, Leicester, Devon, Bradford and Durham. So we are stretching across the world um, tonight. So I'm going to um, bring on our next speaker. Um, and this is the amazing Kate. Osborne MP for Jarrow. So Kay, over to you. Thanks Nadia and um, thank you to all at Arise for putting on this uh, event and for all the work that you do. A good day to have a number of comrades in a room together even if it is virtual and uh, always a pleasure to follow Kevin. Um, can I also send my solidarity to my brilliant comrade Apsana Begum. Uh, Apsana, get well soon. Stay, so, stay strong, sister. Uh, we're all here for you. Um, so as my good friend and comrade Ian said earlier, the demand for public ownership now is not some madcap, ultra-left, unworkable demand, but it is exactly what we need to deal with the cost of living crisis. The crisis in our NHS and social care and so many other problems that we are currently facing. Across Europe, public ownership is totally normal from train networks in Switzerland to publicly owned energy in Denmark and France to free Wi-Fi in public spaces in Greece. Broadband communism, anyone? Yet here in the UK, we continue privatising. As I said in a speech in Westminster today, as much as these Tories can get their grubby little hands on. And my speech this morning was in the context of the NHS, specifically ambulance, and A&E waiting times, with devastating consequences for individuals and staff unable to provide quality care. Of course, you cannot look at the rise in waiting times in isolation. This government, instead of investing in our NHS and staff, are insisting staff take a real terms pay cut and are attacking staff sick pay. Our NHS cannot sustain the current level of attacks from this government, and inevitably it is going to be both staff and patients who will suffer. It's a disgrace that this government are attacking workers that kept us and are still keeping us going through COVID. Workers putting themselves at risk every day going to work to protect us. Called heroes one minute and vilified the next. Now today we've got a new health secretary, but we know that he won't be any different. We know our NHS is not safe in the hands of the Tories. But too many on our own side also parrot the false narrative that more service be, services being outsourced to private companies will bring down waiting times. And we know this is false. The more the private sector becomes involved, the worse the situation becomes as capacity from the NHS is reduced and private companies cherry pick easy and lucrative cases. All this has a devastating consequence of forcing more and more people in pain and desperation to take out loans, crowdfunding on the internet, to pay for an operation because the weight is too much to bear. A two-tier health system 
privatisation by the back door. And it was the NHS's 90, sorry, not 90, 74th birthday yesterday. And as Nye Bevan said, illness is neither an indulgence for which people have to pay, nor an offence for which they should be penalised, but a misfortune, the cost of which should be shared by the community. And if we want to make sure future generations do not have to pay when they are ill, we must urgently ensure our NHS is funded and all parts that have been privatised are bought back in-house and that the NHS is completely renationalised. What we've had over the last few years is a government that has used the COVID pandemic to maximise profits for their cronies and to undermine workers' rights. As a trade unionist, of course, I was on the picket line supporting the RMT and ASLEF in their action. Action, of course, standing up for their members' rights, but also standing up for commuters, demanding a safe, well-staffed railway where people are put before profit. And this out of touch government has underfunded and mismanaged our public transport network for more than a decade and enough is enough. Privatisation compromises public safety against the best interest of the profit margins of private companies. With the situation currently on Britain's railways being that workers are enduring a two or three year pay freeze against a backdrop of rail companies making in excess of 500 million a year in private profits since the start of the COVID health emergency. Private operators, of course, put profits over staff and, commu and communities showing little concern for the safety or interests of the public, where cuts to staffing amount to a cost saving exercise, making our utilities such as the railways, water, energy companies, uh, the mail, more expensive for, for consumers, with less regulation and safety checks in place. And this Tory government is underpinned by hypocrisy and unfairness. We know that Boris Johnson's time in charge, or we knew that his time in charge would be centered on one rule for us and one rule for them. Though the scale of the lies and incompetence was hard to predict. Who knows if Boris Johnson will still be prime minister by the time we finish here tonight? Let's certainly hope not. They've even had to cancel parliamentary business, bill committees tomorrow, because they now don't have enough ministers. What a mess. What a mess. Democracy damaged, halted even. And whilst the Tories continue jeering at each other again today, it is our communities that are suffering from their failures. The worst cost of living crisis, A&E and cancer care waiting time soaring, GP numbers falling, and the NHS struggling under the weight of 6.36 million people waiting for routine procedures. Boris Johnson at PMQ speculated about the reasons people want him to resign. Well, it's quite clear why the country, his MPs and even his cabinet all want him to resign. We're fed up with his lies and his incompetence. He has no authority and no plans to help this country. I chaired the Women and Equalities Committee this afternoon. A detailed discussion on how this government's legislative plans are flawed from the exclusion of our trans siblings from the ban on conversion therapy to the delayed women's health strategy to fertility costs for same-sex couples. And immediately after the meeting, the minister resigned. Just as most departments in Boris, in Boris Johnson's government now in chaos and they're failing to govern and they're failing our communities. And whilst this pantomime continues, people cannot pay their bills. They cannot put fuel in their cars and people are struggling. However, there is also hope. A couple of weeks ago, we saw people come together in my constituency for the Jarrow Rebel Festival. This weekend, we have the Durham Miners Gala and the weekend after that, the Toll Puddle Martyrs Festival. And we have spaces like this provided by Arise to inspire us to remember that we can achieve change and we can fight for and deliver a better society. And whichever Tory is in charge tomorrow, we will fight back and protect our communities. Solidarity, thank you.
Thank you so much. And thank you for everything you do for our class and being a voice for all of the things that are so essential and calling out the, you know, the what the tour is doing to the NHS is absolutely essential that we keep talking about that. You know, for me, uh, it's one of the easiest explanations of what socialism is, isn't it? It's the NHS. So absolutely. thank you for that. Right, I'm going to move on quickly to our next speaker. We have Fraser Maguire, who's a candidate on the Socialist Future slate in Young Labour. So over to you, Fraser. Uh, thank you for that, Nadia. Uh, I think we've already heard some absolutely fantastic things from the previous speakers about why public ownership is so important. Uh, and in my own role as a previous youth officer in the Labour Party, uh, and now that I'm running to be... Um, part of the Socialist Future Slate in the Young Labour uh, internal elections. Uh, I hear from so many young people about issues that they worry about, things that they really care about. And so many of these come down to the issue of public ownership. Um, I think climate change, which is often seen as sort of a huge sort of almost impossible to solve issue. And it's probably the single most important one for people my age and people all across society. Um, and public ownership would play a huge role in solving that. Um, at the recent Glasgow COP26 demonstration, when we saw tens of thousands of people protesting outside, um, there were more delegates from fossil fuel companies inside that um, event than there were representatives of national governments. Fossil fuel companies, private companies, which are driven by the need for profit, driven by the need to make money for their shareholders, rather than have any social responsibility, they're driving the climate crisis. Uh, there was a Guardian report which said that 71% of global emissions are caused by the 100 biggest companies. Climate change isn't a completely abstract issue. It is an economic issue and it is a class issue and public ownership is one of our best weapons in fighting against that. And I think a lot of young people are really starting to actually see that. And that's one reason why public ownership is becoming more and more important. Uh, recently, we've seen, I think it was just today, that the French government nationalised, completely nationalised EDF, which is a major energy company. And if we want to tackle the climate crisis and solve the energy issues, which, I mean, so many people across Britain are dealing with soaring energy bills, as well as the, the issues of the petrol pump, which are affecting um, often the poorest in our society the hardest, we need to take energy companies into public ownership because energy is critical to our lives and we can't, we can't allow it to be run to make profits for individuals. It's just completely unacceptable. Public ownership is about running things in the interests of ordinary people, not for private interests. Um, another uh, really important issue, which uh, Kevin already uh, touched on, is in education academisation. Um, over the last month, I've been leading my local sixth form campaign against it becoming an academy and this is something that young people are really worried about because it's taking the goal of education which is to look after young people to um, develop their skills and help them become uh, make social links and just develop them as people and it's prioritizing profit we don't want for-profit education corporations or companies it's just completely unacceptable and it's having a devastating effect on a lot of young people everywhere, both academisation of secondary schools and the increasing inaccessibility of university. Uh, universities, they're not, they're not about educating people really anymore. They're not about developing skills in higher education. They're about making money. Uh, really, so many young people have to think about their personal finan finances before they apply to uni. Think, can, can I afford to go to uni? Will this maintenance loan even cover my accommodation? Will I be able to work enough hours to afford it? I mean, um, it's so many young people affected by that. And that is because we have education run for profit rather than for public interest. And uh, a recent, well, last year, the Institute of Economic Affairs, which isn't an organisation I would normally find myself quoting from, uh, said that 67% of 16 to 34 year olds would like to see the UK transition to a socialist economic system. Uh, that is a system characterised by uh, the principles of justice, equality and of course public ownership. And I think this is really because young people, as well as people across societies, we're seeing from 
the RMT victories uh, inspiring people. People are starting to make these connections, which that public ownership will improve society for every single one of us, because key industry is not just energy and education, but the NHS, uh, housing, transport, all of these things which should be run for public interest are not being. We had housing, which is huge issue. I mean, the housing crisis is meaning so many people think they're never going to make it onto the housing ladder. And we've got a government which is trying to increase the mortgage time to 50 years, which often means that parents will be leaving their mortgage debt behind for their children. 70 years ago, we had both Conservative and Labour governments building 250,000 social houses a year. Now, if the Labour Party said they were going to build 100,000, that could be dismissed as overly radical. And it's not even a reversal of what Thatcher did to housing. So it is every single aspect of society, transport, housing, education, energy, would hugely benefit from public ownership. And it gives me hope that more and more young people are starting to recognise that and people across our society. But there is still a long way to go. There's a lot of things that are privatised and even taking them back into public ownership would only be a reversal of Thatcher era policies. We have to go further. We, not, we can't just take them back into public ownership. We have to do more, completely end privatisation in the NHS. Um, but the broadband communism, which Jeremy Corbyn was attacked for, would benefit a huge amount of people at a time when soaring prices are making life difficult for so many. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Fraser. Again, it's just proving that to tackle these crises, we need to put people before profit, don't we? OK, so moving on to our final speaker this evening, and then we'll move on to some questions afterwards. We've now got John Bosco and Ogbu, um, the lead campaigner for We Own It. So over to you, John Bosco. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. Thank you so much, um, Nadia, for that um, in, um, introduction. Um, we Own It, for those of you who do not know, is um, an organization that campaigns for public ownership. Um, we are not a Labour Party organization, so to speak, but we obviously work very closely with um, a good number of Labour MPs and also a great many Labour members because these people um, tend to support public ownership overall. But we, we have worked quite closely with a good number of Conservative MPs on some important anti-privatisation campaigns, such as one that we are running at the moment that um, is giving me very um, good vibes at the moment, given what's happening in government, their effort to privatize Channel 4. If um, somebody should uh, dislodge um, um, Nadine Doris from her position, we might um, uh, save Channel 4 from being sold off to their friends, the way they sold off the Royal Mail. So if you would like to get involved in the work that We On It does, of course, weonit.org.uk is the place to go. Um, there's been a lot um, that has been said this evening um, about um, public ownership, um, what it looks like in different sectors, um, the advantages of it um, as opposed to privatization and all of that. And it seems to me that, that I mean, the speakers that have, have spoken before me have canvassed that area really, really well. And I think that there isn't very much um, use in me kind of reiterating the, what they have said. I do want to kind of jump into this discussion by way of kind of capturing the opportunities that I think we have at the moment, given what's happening um, in the country. Um, I imagine that if you are watching this stream, you are probably not um, oblivious to the fact that um, Boris Johnson is having his ministers um, um, res resign left, right and center at the moment. And I, I think that some people are very optimistic in believing that that's going to make him resign, but if it does, that would be a really good thing. Um, but I'm not, that's my personal view. Um, yeah, but I don't think we should um, hang our hopes on that. What, it, what I think it does tell us is that um, there, is so, there is enough turmoil at the moment and it feels very much like the amount of turmoil we had um, headed into the 2019 general election. And in fact, in many ways, very similar to the kind of turmoil that we had headed into the 2017 election as well. Um, that it, it, it's beginning to seem somewhat realistic that um, an election might be in the offing. Um, so what are, in some ways, 
what are the opportunities that such an election offers, uh, offers us to advance the agenda of public ownership? Um, so I, I would first, I would say that it is important to um, kind of keep in mind that I don't think it is always a matter of a list of policies, right? We've spoken about public ownership here in, in transportation, in energy, in, in um, the NHS and in a good number of other areas. Um, I didn't hear people mention water. Um, our rivers have been polluted at the moment by water companies. Um, people are becoming sick. Polio is making a comeback. Um, I didn't know. I didn't know. I would have to say that in the UK in 2022, um, right? So public privatization is destroying the fabric of our society, and public ownership is clearly the solution to this destruction. And not only is it the solution, it is a solution that the vast majority of British people recognize as the solution to it. Um, so I don't think that we need to think of this as kind of approaching an election with uh, a list of policies that we're going to kind of advance in our election. Um, I think that it is quite useful for us to think about this fr from the point of view of what are people's desires and hopes at the moment. And I think, um, personally, I think that the defining issue of these times is the cost of living crisis, right? But before I kind of come to speaking about that cost of living crisis, um, the difference between um, kind of the list of policies versus thinking about the issue in terms of what are people's desires and hopes is the difference in my mind, at least between popularity and salience, right? So, you, if, I mean, we all know that when you ask people what their views are about privatization of some public service versus public ownership of that service, the vast majority of them will say public ownership. But then, of course, when they get to the polls, something else carries their mind away and they vote for the party that is going to privatize things. And I think that the reason that that happens is that people support public ownership, but they don't carry it in their heads and in their hearts when they step into the polling booth. And in the last election, I think that they carried Brexit in their minds and heads a great deal more than they did uh, public ownership, despite the uh, significant amount of support for it. And I think that we need to think of ways, we need to weave our narratives around public ownership into people's desires and hopes I think Brexit captured those desires and hopes for a great many people. And I think we can do the same in the context of the cost of living crisis for public ownership um, of our public services in a way that I think um, allows it to be the reason people vote for the parties they vote for in a general election that we think may be coming soon. And just to kind of cast a little bit um, um, as to what the context of the cost of living crisis, and I mean, I think we're all fairly familiar with it because we are living in it ourselves. Um, but just to kind of offer a few indicator, indicators, the NHS has, of course, um, its um, record high um, waiting lists. And that doesn't just mean that the NHS is incredibly under pressure. Um, the doctors and nurses and cooks and porters and cleaners and all of those who make that incredible health service work um, are not kind of, they're put under in, in a lot more pressure than normal. Um, it also does mean that a lot of people are being forced at the moment to pay for their own health care by going private. Um, last year, my understanding is that last year, private health care companies, uh, for the first time, had revenues that crossed a billion pounds. They made over 200 million pounds in profit from um, providing health care to people who can no longer wait for the NHS, right? Um, so in essence, we need to be asking people are you prepared to pay 3,000 pounds for a hernia oppression? Are you prepared to pay 15,000 pounds for a hip replacement? Right? That is the context of the cost of living crisis that we're living in. Um, last year, the um, cost of rail fares went up by almost 4%, um, the highest that it's gone for a decade. Um, very soon, I think at the end of this month or the end of next month, I'm not entirely sure of that, um, the government's um, pandemic support for buses is going to end. And that means 135, according to the Guardian, 135 bus routes will be closed. Um, and those are bus routes that we need, people in our community depend on to get to their jobs or to reach family and friends and all of that. Um, and the reason that this is happening, of course, is that those routes are not profitable for private companies. Um, local councils have to bribe them in essence 
um, with public money to make it profitable for them to run it. Whereas if the public ran that bus service, the public, the, the public would not need to be thinking about profit, be thinking about whether or not there are people in this area that need this service, right? So our buses is an, incredible, an incredibly important area, um, a lot more important than I think that a lot of us give it credit for. Uh, we like to think about the huge things um, that kind of have a national focus, but buses are incredibly important. Um, energy bills, of course, have gone up 119% in the last year. So that is the cost, kind of the cost of living crisis context in which I think public ownership can um, essentially offer the solution. And um, I, I imagine I'm already running out of time right now, but I'm going to quickly kind of whiz through um, some of the, I think, ways that public ownership could help us weave a narrative around um, the cost of living crisis um, that we think could allow people to say to themselves, this is an election in which I'm voting for my future. It's an election, and I think Fraser did a really good job of capturing that point. Um, it's an election in which I'm voting for my ability to, to not die of the cold. It's, um, it's an election in which I'm voting for the stability of my finances. Um, yeah, so, and, and of course we know that in terms of energy, um, a, public, a publicly owned um, default energy supplier is already a norm in many parts of the world. And somebody spoke earlier about um, EDF that was already almost entirely owned by the French government. They have now taken, taken the whole thing um, to, into the air control, into um, public ownership in France. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an energy company that operates here in the UK. It's very much similar to what happens now, railways. Um, the RMT had research, I think it was last year, two years ago, they found that 70% of our rail companies are actually owned by other European countries. Um, they recognize that public ownership is good and they are practic practicing it here in the UK where we, we are deciding to um, allow private companies to run our services. So we could, we could essentially bring in a default energy provider. The US is, if you like, in some ways, the, the, the shiny thing of privatization in the world but the US actually has treats an energy, energy supply as an area in which public ownership is common sense, right? That's the case in the vast majority of, not the vast majority, but a good number of American states and you would not expect it. And it's, that's the case in Italy, in France, in Germany. In Italy, um, Italy's um, supplier provides 27 million households with energy um, at prices that are six to 16% lower than their competitors. And it's common sense why that would be the case. You don't have to factor in profit, right? That's, that's part of the reason why we pay the prices we pay for energy, because we're also paying for somebody's children to um, go to a private school, or we're also paying for, somebody's, uh, for somebody to own a private jet and all of that stuff, right? So if you John, remove that... John, sorry, John Bosco, I'm just conscious we're kind of running out of time, and I wanted to get a couple of questions in from, um, from our mem uh, the audience tonight. Is the, and, and I'll let you um, do a bit of summing up at the end, if that's okay, we'll give you a minute to do that. Yeah. Um, a lot of the questions that are coming out really about, um, um, so MD um, Genjin and Wanda are talking about how can we, um, well, MD wanted to know how he can prove his mum wrong that nationalisation is too expensive. Um, you know, um, there's a denial of the healthcare um, that, you know, private, um, privatization within the healthcare is destroying the NHS. How can we prove um, that, you know, nationalization in the 1960s and 70s, you know, people are saying it didn't work. How can we say to people that it did? And, and, and the other thing that's coming out is what is the difference between public ownership and nationalization? So I don't know if you want to come in on that and, and phrase, but if you could just give maybe a minute just to respond to those couple of questions. Um, I think that would be really useful. Is that okay? Fraser, do you want to come in first? Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll happily come in uh, to talk about, especially with when people say uh, in the past whether or not public ownership actually works. Because uh, I think often it's about what you actually, what do you mean by that? Because sure, privatisation might be technically efficient in that it gets a return on its money it puts in a certain amount of money and then it makes a lot back as profit. That's how we define efficiency. But public ownership isn't about, it's about quality. It's not just about how, uh, privatisation is a race to the bottom, really, at the end of the day. 
It's about stripping assets from companies. It's about uh, pushing wages down, stuff like that. So when people talk about success, sure, it might make more money. It might even grow the economy. But that isn't necessarily a positive when you're seeing wages going down, when you're seeing prices going up. So that's what I would I would say on that one. I would say, what do, what do you mean by success? Because public ownership has a higher, it delivers a better quality. It looks after its workers. Uh, while privatization, sure, it might make more money at the end of the day, but that money will be going to already wealthy individuals. It will be going to shareholders, and it will come at the expense of ordinary working people. And we've seen that time and time again when things have been privatized. Sure, it might. It might make more money, but that's not that's not what this is about. That's not what we're talking about. We don't want a society where all of our key infrastructure and industries are run to make private individuals as much money as possible. We want things run in the interests of the British public. And that's what public ownership is about. And that's where it succeeds. Thank you for that. John Bosco. Um, I, I should start by saying that I don't think that that the people who ask those questions are anywhere near um, a good amount of the public. If you look at the polling, the vast majority of the public believe that public ownership is the solution to the chaos that we are experiencing in a good many of our public services. So there is not a lot of people out there for us to convince. I think what we need to do is make the issue important enough for people to carry it in their hearts and in their heads when they step into the polling booth to vote. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind that we were a, lot, a lot of those people who are skeptical about public ownership are skeptical about it because of the story that we're told when the switch was done, if you like, between, uh, from public ownership to privatization, where the, the idea was that, well, privatization is going to be a lot more cost effective. Um, and I mean, um, Kevin spoke earlier today about um, the cost of some of those special schools when they're run by private companies versus when they're run by public um, um, by councils. Um, as uh, incredible as that is, a 20,000 pound difference. Um, and I mean, we did some research earlier this year about free school meals. When they are done by private companies and when they're done by councils, they are cheaper when they're done by councils. So the evidence, literally every single claim that was made by the architects of privatization has been proven to be bogus. And we've had 30, 40 years to prove it right. And it's not proven right, right? So you can show them in all of that evidence when they ask you about it. Um, the, in terms of the difference between um, public ownership and private and nationalization, um, at least from a we own it point of view, I'd say that there is a small difference and there is no difference. Um, the small difference, I think, is that um, in a good number of areas, there, there is nationalization gives the sense of that this is kind of going to be put together into one under one authority and controlled nationally, right? And the government controls it. Um, whereas I think in, in many um, areas, such as say in rail and in um, other areas, such as schools as well, um, the, the control for those um, 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 publicly owned services would be, not, would be local. And we would want to bring in more local democracy and democratic control um, over those services. So in that respect, nationalization doesn't feel like the correct terminology. It's exactly the same thing, public ownership but we, are, we want to be more precise in terms of um, where the control for those services will be. And um, it's also a bit of a kind of, if you like a, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, propaganda term, if you like. Nationalization is a very old word. And um, yeah, it, it doesn't, it feels like it's been demonized enough and we're not, we're not stepping away from a word because it's been demonized, but um, public ownership feels, at least we find that it feels, it feels a lot less dangerous to people. Um, and, and it captures what we are going for exactly as perfectly as nationalization. So why not use it? Brilliant. Thank you for that. So I'm just going to read a brief message and then I'll just give you um, both a, a minute at the end um, just to sum up or, or just a sentence that you would like people to take away from the, um, the session tonight. So whilst I do that, um, if you just want to think about what you want to say. So I just want to thank 
everybody. I want to thank everyone that's partook on the panel tonight and, and everyone that's come along to watch um, tonight's event. You know, this um, is part of the ongoing festival ideas, which runs right through to July the 28th. So please follow the links in the chat and please sign up to the other events. It's really important that we keep ourselves motivated um, during these times. Um, we know that we have important battles ahead and we also know just how important our campaign for people, health and the planet to be put first is resisting privatisation and supporting the extension of public ownership and control is essential to this. A better future, a socialist future even, is possible. We have a world to win. Let's do it together. Um, for your information, the next Arise event is on Friday, the 8th of July at 1pm, and that is Justice for the Global South as part of the Lefty Lunchtime series. So again, thank you for coming along tonight. I'm just going to quickly go back to our panellists and just have them just give you the message they want you to take away for tonight. So, John Bosco, I'll let you go first. I would say my message is that almost everyone already agrees that public ownership is the solution to the disaster of privatization, the 40 year old um, disaster of privatization. Of course, we still need to continue to make the case for it. What I think we need to do now is do what we need to do to win. And that means beginning to frame public ownership in a way that allows people to see it as a thing that will change their lives. At the moment, it feels somewhat intellectual if we want to get it to a place where they vote for it, let's make it a thing that they see as something that will change their lives. And that's my message to everyone. And if you would like to get more involved in the work that We Own It does, um, as I said earlier, it's weownit.org.uk. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Fraser? Um, yeah, uh, I'd just like to thank Arise and all the speakers we've had. We've been absolutely fantastic. And it's so important that we're able to have uh, discussions and events like this. Um, I'd like to say, if you're in Young Labour and you're able to vote in the upcoming internal elections, uh, I would massively uh, encourage you to vote for the Socialist Future Slate, who will unapologetically stand for principles of equality, justice and public ownership and how important that is. Uh, and I hope everyone can go away from today knowing that there is hope. We're up against a massive opponent, which is privatisation, but we're seeing work solidarity and we, we, people are really starting to realise how much power we have. And we're seeing that with RMT and we're seeing that with the upcoming strikes. So there is always hope. Brilliant. Thank you. And solidarity to everybody watching.